Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat, and with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way, I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv You're listening to Revolution Radio. As little as long ago, or as far away as forever, this is where we meet to celebrate what never was as it comes to pass. Welcome, friends. Thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here at freedomslips.com, Revolution Radio, and Studio B. I'm uh, honored to have as guest with me Rob Skiba. Um, he's done incredible work on, well, this will be the second in the series that I've been uh, doing, covering the topic of the Flat Earth and also the release of my latest book, The Flat Earth as Key to Decrypt the Book of Enoch. Uh, Rob's been doing really incredible work on this particular issue and um, he's also got a new website called testingtheglobe.com, which everybody can go to to see his latest work. But uh, he's also an award-winning documentary filmmaker and a best-selling author of several books, eight, um, including Babylon Rising, The First Shall Be the Last, The Archon Invasion, The Rise and Fall, and Return of the Nephilim, which is always one of um, your and my favorite topics and as an ancient Nephilim theorist Rob brings a unique and often unheard perspective to the UFO alien discussion he is now an internationally recognized public speaker on these subjects often appearing on paranormal and prophecy talk shows and as a featured keynote speaker at conferences all around the world he's a graduate of the Hollywood Film Institute his lifelong dream has been to produce a powerful television and motion picture productions. He's currently working full-time on the development and production of Seed the Series. Um, Rob also has an, a couple of radio programs um, that he... Well, I don't know if you do still do the one on Blog Talk, but I know he um, hosts a show Wednesday evening... Uh, on Truth Frequency Radio, and so I'll get Rob to detail the his individual books, where you can contact him, where you can support um, the purchase of his work, as well as you know keep up with his projects. Very busy individual, highly educated, well respected, and um, Rob, you do incredible investigative work on all the topics that you cover. So if you would please. Um, just you know, provide your contact information, short commentary on yourself, and then if you would, uh, we'll go into just a, a short description of each one of the books that you've published. Sure. Hey, Zen, thanks so much for having me on, man. Uh, it's my honor, brother. Yeah. Uh, well, my primary website uh, is babylonrisingbooks.com. From there, you can get to just about everything else, uh, with the exception of testing the globe. I don't think I have a link on there uh, for that, as it's my most recent endeavor. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that tonight. Right. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've published uh, eight books. Uh, Babylon Rising, The First Shall Be Last, is my first book. Published that back in January of 2012. Um, <clears throat> the first chapter was called The Genesis 6 Experiment. And it was probably the shortest chapter in the book, just sort of setting the stage for the, the topic of the Nephilim. And from then, I went on to discuss uh, primarily Nimrod, Babylon, and and how our government is steeped in all of that stuff. So it was a lot of conspiracy type of things in that book. But after I published it, I realized I really got to unpack that first chapter. So my second book, Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim, is about a 366-page elaboration on chapter one of my first book. 
and it gets into the subject of uh, the biblical timeline primarily of the Nephilim. I, I wanted to kind of do an all-encompassing work, but after I got to about over 350 pages, I thought, you know what, I better stop because I wouldn't read this book <laughs> <laughs> if, if I kept going. I mean, I do have some books that are over 350 pages, but most of the time if I see a book that thick, it becomes a reference book only. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'll probably never read the whole thing. <laughs> you know. So I thought, if I won't read it, nobody else will read it probably. So it, it's really, uh, Babylon Rising is sort of part one of a, what I intend to be a four-part series, and Archon Invasion is uh, part one of a two-part series. And um, after I did that, I, I spent a lot of time talking about what I referred to as the synchronized, biblically endorsed, extra-biblical texts. And uh, by that, I, I was referring to the books of the extra biblical books of Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees. And after talking so much about it at conferences and stuff like that, I figured, you know what, I might as well just publish them. So I created a, um, a, w- a one volume that includes the book of Genesis in the King James as well as the Septuagint side by side like a parallel Bible because there are some pretty significant differences between the two. And I thought, you know, it'd be pretty cool to compare them. So that's at the beginning of the book is Genesis as a parallel, King James and Septuagint. And then it's the full books of uh, Enoch, Joshua, and Jubilees all in one volume. And that's an eight and a half by 11, over 500 page deal. So it's kind of like, you know, it's one of those great for reference. I don't know if anybody's going to read it cover to cover, but some people might. Uh, And then the other five books that I did are Bible study workbooks. Um, I call them the Wisdom from the Torah uh, uh, workbook series. And basically my goal with those were, I've been studying the Torah now for, uh, well, this will be my seventh year now, going into seventh year. Um, And what I realized is every single reference that we find in the scriptures to the word scripture Whenever, like, if you just did a keyword search on the word scripture throughout all the Bible, you'll find that in every single case, except for one, it's referencing the Torah, the prophets, and the and the Psalms, the writings, the Old Testament, basically. And it just makes sense because even in the New Testament, when they were talking about the scriptures, the New Testament hadn't been written yet. So that's what they were referring to. But I, I came to realize that the Torah is the Bible of the people in the Bible. In other words, that was the Bible that they were using. Yeah, all the prophets, the Psalms, they're all referring back to the Torah. And I had come across, uh, I believe it's Luke 24, if I'm not mistaken, on the address, when uh, Yeshua, Jesus, is walking on the road to Emmaus, and these guys that he's with, they don't recognize him. And it says that he began with Moses and the prophets to illustrate from the Scriptures who he was. And it really struck me because I could— Tell you all about my Savior from the Gospels and the Epistles of Paul, you know, the New Testament. And, you know, I could use Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22 and maybe a few other places, um, but I couldn't build a case for my Messiah from the Torah. And so my prayer became, all right, Father, you know, if, if, you, if that's what Yeshua did to illustrate who he was, then please do the same for me. Um, show, reveal yourself, reveal your son to me through the Torah. And that began a really amazing journey for me that I'm still on. And so um, for thousands of years, people have been doing what they call the Torah portions, where every week they take a portion from the Torah, sort of like a a walk through the Bible, like the one-year Bibles, um, but specifically using the Torah, going through the Torah in a year, but also going through what's called the half Torah or the half Torah, the, um, the prophets. And, uh, after the time of the New Testament, they began to incorporate New Testament scriptures that go along with the Torah portion. So my goal was to show, in, like in each volume, I got one for Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, was to show how the themes of each Torah portion are literally woven throughout your whole Bible, throughout the, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I created them as workbooks uh, so that there's plenty of space for you to take your own notes. Uh, after doing those tour portions for three years myself i had notebooks and stuff scribbled on things all over the place i was like ah i need i need to have one place to put them all in so really i created the workbook for myself but uh the people in our home bible study group uh loved it so i thought you know i'll just go ahead and publish these and uh they've become uh 
pretty popular, um, even more so now that I'm starting to put the um, our, our, our Bible studies up on YouTube and the Word's starting to get out. So those are the eight books that I've done, and that's all, again, uh, available, and you can check them out on uh, BabylonRisingBooks.com. Well, that's a really awesome endeavor because, uh, you know, so many people nowadays, they believe that all you need to do is read the New Testament. You don't ever have to reference the Old Testament. And um, because they believe and think like that, they, you know, are divorced from so much of what I consider to be uh, very relevant, important teachings, especially when, you know, when you're tracking down the whole you know, because when I first read Genesis 6 about the sons of God mating with the daughters of man, I was like, what? What did I just read? <laughs> and then uh, looking into the whole, the wars, you know, as far as the, the giants, the lineage of, of giants going all the way even to, you know, David and Goliath and the battles between his bloodlines and uh, the four brothers of Goliath and Og and... Um, and, and Noah and, uh, and all of all of that is just uh, amazing information and and yeah. why people wouldn't want to study all that is um, is just beyond me because there's so much there but yeah so I applaud you and your 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 efforts to backtrack and to look and you know really research in detail uh, how it applies to Yeshua as our as our savior because. Um, it, you know, the Old Testament lays the foundation for the new, and um, you, you can't separate both because he was the the fulfillment. Especially when you start looking at the the Levitical Leviticus twenty three feast days and how he yes. fulfilled the spring and summer feasts, and how he will fulfill the you know the the fall feasts. All of that is just so very important. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, before we, you know, go into the topic that we'll be predominantly covering uh, this evening, um, also when you when I turn it back over to you, if you would provide your uh, where people can contact you and support your, you know, um, you know as far as your the different websites, um, I know that you did you say you had more than those two that were mentioned, but sure. Um... Yeah, I'll just kind of go, I'll run down them. As you mentioned in the uh, introduction, I, I am on truthfrequencyradio.com uh, on Wednesday evenings. In fact, tonight, after I get off with you, uh, we will uh, we go live at 11 p.m. Central. So on truthfrequencyradio.com is my radio show. Uh, I still have my archives up on my blog talk show, uh, blogtalkradio.com forward slash revolutionary radio. There's probably well over 200 shows up there. And I'm going to try to... Uh, archive my truth frequency shows over on the blog talk one too because a lot of people have the um, iTunes RSS feed so it makes it easier for them so I intend to do that um, uh, if people are interested in the Bible studies that I've been talking about uh, related to the Torah portions it's at virtualhousechurch.com and uh, something you said a minute ago Zen is so true uh, so many of us as Christians uh, and I've said it myself I'm a, I'm a New Testament Bible believing Christian and it's true, I am. However, that's sort of like going to you know Barnes and Noble or you know Borders or someplace and and getting the the greatest novel ever written and skipping three quarters of the book, right. you know, right. and and just re start reading at the last twenty five percent and thinking you actually have a clue who the characters are, what their motivation is, you know, what the plot is. So yeah, I I really do believe that it's time to get back to Genesis and. Uh, Isaiah 4, 6, 10 says that God declares the end from the beginning. So really, if you want to understand Revelation, you actually got to go back to Genesis. And uh, my wife had this idea uh, several years ago. She said, you know, why don't, we, why don't we try reading both ends toward the middle? You know, read Genesis and Revelation and Exodus and Jude and sort of work our way, you know, oh, towards that's the cool. Yeah, and, you know, it was a novel idea. I thought, yeah, that's interesting. Sure, why not? I've, I've done plenty of other one-year Bible plans. You know, why not try that? Well, I didn't get very far in when, especially when you start getting into Exodus, having just read Revelation along with Genesis, that you quickly realize that Revelation is just an amped up repeat of the Exodus. The plagues are the same. I mean, it, I actually created a, a, a parallel chart showing the plagues of Exodus with the plagues of Revelation, and, and they're play by play, man. It's, Revelation is just an amped up repeat of Exodus. 
Uh, so if people are interested in sort of, I, I, I put it on live. It was every Friday nights. I, I did it live for two years, 2012 and 2013, and all the archives are up there and all the notes and stuff that we talked about. So if they want to check that out, uh, it's at virtualhousechurch.com. I already mentioned babylonrisingbooks.com, uh, which came as a result, actually, of my blog, which is babylonrisingblog.com. Um, all the books came out of the blogs. And, and I wrote for 2011, basically the entire year, I, I just wrote nonstop. So I woke up in the morning, whatever I thought about, I wrote about. And uh, at the end of the year, I decided to see how much I wrote. So I sort of pulled down from blog format into some print format software and realized I had well over a thousand pages of print content. I said, whoa, man, I should make books out of these. So the Babylon Rising books came out of Babylon Rising blog. Dot com and um, all of that is really the nonfiction foundation upon which the science fiction TV series that I'm working on is is, is being built, and that's at seedtheseries.com. So those are the primary uh, websites people can check out, and of course there's contact information on the websites. Well, I know that you have a ton of information at testingtheglobe.com. Uh, do you plan on doing the same? Um that you did with Babylon Rising and and yes. what are you gonna yeah so yeah. any any idea on timeline on for that? Well, um, I, I've got an experiment that actually two experiments that I'm working on. I'm not gonna really share the details on it, but two experiments that I'm hoping to do within the next month or two, if, if at all possible. And it's gonna cost a little bit of money, but um, if I can do these two experiments. Because uh, right now my problem with testingtheglobe.com is I haven't really come to a definitive conclusion. I have concluded, no questions asked, def absolutely definitively I know the Bible is a f flat earth book from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, there's no question in my mind about it. However, uh, 1 Thessalonians tells me that I should test or prove all things. So that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, testingtheglobe.com really came as a result of Going through an in-depth study of the Scripture, I've got a whole section just on the Bible and the still flat earth. It's rather lengthy. And when I went through the Scriptures to see what it had to say about the heavens, what it had to say about the earth, what it had to say about the sun, moon, and stars, I came away just going, wow, what do I do with this? Because, you know, this is this is a flat earth book, man. Right. And uh, that's what launched me on the journey that I'm still on. Uh, but... But proving it is is rather interesting. Yes, there are a lot of terrestrial-based observations that anybody can do that, frankly, reveal it's flat. Um, but then you always have the, the you have the yeah, but guy shows up. Well, yeah, but this and yeah, but it's a mirage and yeah, it's light refraction and blah blah blah. I'm going okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna come up with a test that will get rid of the yeah, but guy. And so that's what I'm working on. And, and once I once I get the results of that, and if it turns out the way that I anticipated that it's going to turn out, um, then I'll be a lot more conclusive uh, openly and in public. You know, because people are asking me all the time, "Well, are you a flat earther or not?" I said, "Well, I, at this point, I am most comfortable calling myself uh, a zetetic agnostic." <laughs> and Zetetic just means basically science by inquiry, going out and, and, and asking questions and doing investigations by observation. Um, and an agnostic, most people hear agnostic and you think, well, you don't what you don't believe in God. Well, that's one definition for agnostic. But basically, an agnostic is somebody who is not at least convinced in their own mind that they can prove the existence of something either way. You know, most often associated with God. Um, I obviously do believe in God. But when it comes to the issue of the earth and the shape and nature of it, I know what the text says, but trying to prove it um, so far has been inconclusive uh, for me. Uh, there's a lot of great evidence for the flat earth, no doubt about it. I've been putting it up. But there's also you know, a lot of stuff, to be fair, trying to be objective here, there's a lot of stuff that I can't debunk on the globalist side. So at this point, I, I'm basically saying, hey, Let's start asking the questions because I'm 46 years old. I don't know about you, Zen, but I have never questioned the globe in 46 years of my life until April 15th of, uh, or April 13th of this year. 
uh, it was the beginning of my questioning it. So uh, testingtheglobe.com is, as one section of it says, it's one man's quest for truth. And, you know, that's me. I'm, I'm the man that's on the quest for truth in this case. And it's basically been my online journal of discovery, of inquiry, uh, of investigation. And um, it, once I get to where I, I feel like I, I've got a pretty solid conclusion, then I'll start uh, uh, publishing a book. I have a book already in the works, uh, just waiting for that final chapter, I guess, to be written. Well, that's, uh, that's awesome. And you're smart to be um, careful in, you know, in respect to this. And, um, and I think it's also wise to, to be kind of hush-hush on your endeavors just until you're ready to release. The, that was the same way that I was with uh, my latest uh, endeavor with this book that I just released. I didn't want to give out too much detail on that either. Uh, and you're right. Yeah, I never had reason to question my belief in the globe. I just assumed that, you know, because it had been uh, what I thought to be, you know, scientifically affirmed um, over the last 500 years, and there would be no reason to, to doubt all those assumptions. But um, lo and behold, there there is reason to to look into and to try to deter and at least um, objectively, open-mindedly go into the debate of is the Earth really flat or spherical? And and I think everybody should do that investigation and that people would be surprised at what they might um, actually find and maybe we're not uh, as, as sure of what we think we know. Um, yeah. But before we, we've, we're going to come up to the first break in about five minutes, but I want to give you a chance before we go into this uh, to talk about kind of how you woke up to, you know, the whole what woke you up to um, the introspection into all of these things, the Nephilim, um, uh, the conspiracy side of life and reality, um, kind of your journey to, you know, awakening and to where you are now. Yeah, that, well, uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that before the break, but I'll, yeah, I'll, well, we can just start it and we'll pick it up on the other side. Continue it. Well, I've, you know, the the Genesis six thing is something I've always been interested in. I mean, what kid, what, what kid is not interested in giants? You right. Know, we, we've all, you know, if you grew up in church, David and Goliath. I mean, I, 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 I've done you know dress up as David, you know, with the slingshot and you know the whole deal for skits and whatnot. Um, and we all grew up with, uh, you know, Gulliver's Travels and, uh, you know, Jolly Green Giant. And, you know, there's always like this giant thing is, you know, it, it just comes with the territory, I guess. You know, we, we grew up with it. So it's something I've always been interested in. Um, but the more I looked into it in the Bible, the more I, I realized, wow, I mean, nobody's, at least in my sphere of influence growing up, was talking about it. You know, uh, other than David and Goliath, but that's about it. That's about all we, you get in church. But as I started to dig in and look in for more evidence of giants and whatnot in the Bible for myself, I found out, wow, I mean, the Old Testament is Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I mean, <Right>. it's just <laughs> loaded with epic, crazy battles and stuff. And But what it did for me, Zen, was... Uh, growing up as a New Testament Bible believing Christian, we you know we didn't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament. Yes, there was the Sunday school lessons and stuff that we'd get little bits and pieces of, but you know most of the time church. And I was one of these Sunday school, Sunday morning service, Sunday night service, Wednesday night service. You know, vacation Bible school kind of guys. It's like we were always doing something with the church and the Bible, uh, but not really diving too deeply into the Old Testament. And whenever I would do those one year Bible plans. Um, I wouldn't get too far in before I would start getting tweaked out. And I remember back in the early 90s, I want to say maybe even 1990, 1991, somewhere thereabouts, possibly even late 80s, I had this idea of I'm going to get a notebook uh, and I'm going to start in Genesis and I'm just going to journal my thoughts as I'm reading through the Bible and write down questions that I have as I'm reading it. And uh, hopefully as I continue reading, that I'll be able to answer the questions that I have, just doing my own personal study. And I would always get bogged down where in the Torah you would find these various campaigns that the Israelites were on where God would be saying, you know, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everything, you know, utterly destroy everything. 
And but that wasn't always the case. Sometimes they had these uh, battles where the standard rules of war applied. Of course, the men would you know they would fight the men, but they could keep the women and children and the animals and whatnot as spoils of war. So you're kind of left with this feeling that God is schizophrenic and prejudiced, and it's a random acts of genocide. You know, it's like. Right. And, and I would just have to stop because I was getting so tweaked out. Like, I don't know what to do with this, you know. And yet you get to the New Testament. John, I think it's chapter 14 where Philip asked Jesus, you know, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient. And Jesus says, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Well, that never computed in my head, man, because it's like, you know, here's Yeshua. He's this amazing, loving guy. He's hanging out with publicans and sitters. He's not – the only people he judged were the religious people. You know, I mean, he's healing people, casting out demons. This amazing, loving, awesome guy. And he says, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen my dad. And I'm going, ah, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know, because dad's really scary and you're not so scary. You know, I'm, it's kind of like this good cop, bad cop thing, you know. Right. And – uh, and then years – that was all through my childhood and well into the 90s. But going into the 2000s, I ended up finally coming across the materials of Steve Quayle and uh, then later Tom Horn. And I heard a statement that Steve Quayle had made. He said, the understanding of Genesis 6 is the Rosetta Stone for understanding all of Scripture and history. And uh, that seemed like a rather grandiose statement to make but uh, at the time. But then after I started to look into Genesis 6 a lot more and really dive into it, I got what he said. And right. now I, w- I would absolutely you know, say I agree 100% with that statement. <laughs> because as soon as you get what's going on in Genesis 6, the whole Bible starts to make a lot more sense, and, and history does as well. So uh, I would studied that stuff for most of my life, uh, but didn't really start to get a clue as to what I was looking at until the— um, probably the mid-2000s, and then going into the 2010 through today, I got real intentional about uh, writing about it, talking about it, getting on the public scene, and, you know, of course, publishing books eventually and DVDs about it too. So that's where my sort of a, the genesis, if you will, of, of that was. But in the process of doing that, I found out a lot of really intriguing things regarding Nimrod and how I believe he relates to end times and the Antichrist and things of that nature. And so that gave me something more to dig. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. I have as guest with me this evening, Rob Skiba. Um, Rob, I'm going to give you a chance to um, finish what what you were speaking about, but also when you decide to go into uh, the topic of the flat earth, if you'll open with um, the answer Nimble Horse posted in the chat room, um, the Bible verse, the, he stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. And I just heard you actually speaking about that in a show that you did on the pillars. So when you're um, you know, done with the, your, your awakening story, <laughs> if you would, co- go into that. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I was just talking about going through the Bible and, and the Nephilim and Nimrod and all that stuff. And, of course, you know, to, to study, study those two subjects, the Nephilim and Nimrod, you're spending a lot of time in the Torah. And while I was doing that and finding all kinds of really wild and amazing cool stuff in, in regard to those two subjects, I was also f- beginning to find Yeshua in the Torah. And it was, so it's sort of like God used that stuff as the bait you know, to, you know, draw me in, to get me fascinated and, and to say, hey, you know, while you're looking at it, check this out, you know. And uh, so th- that's sort of a sideline uh, that uh, really got me uh, intrigued, uh, not just in the Torah, but also in the Hebrew language in general. Um, I ended up taking a Hebrew 101 twice. That shows you my aptitude for picking up another language. <laughs> but... Um, uh, what I did learn out of it was the Hebrew language is really fascinating and that uh, every Hebrew letter, just the letters themselves, have meanings, and up to seven meanings. And we learned an idiom in class that if every letter has seven meanings, then every word has 70 because you have not only the meaning of the word itself, but you have the combined meaning of the letters that comprise the word as well as the meaning of the two or three letter Shoresh, the root word, from which a lot of words are, are, are derived by adding prefixes and suffixes. And there's numerical values, so then you get into sort of the biblical gematria type of stuff and Bible codes and all that kind of stuff. 
and I mean, just was completely uh, amazed by it and uh, very intrigued and wanted to know more and continued to dig. And what I found in my Nephilim research was that, you know, those chapters where you get to so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, right. and you usually skip past it because you can't pronounce the names, <laughs> right. you know, man, there's a treasure trove of information in, in a lot of the, I'm not, I'm not sure that in every single one, but in a lot of the ones that I looked into, the genealogies are given in very specific orders, uh, not just because of the chronology in which people are born, but a lot of times uh, because there's a meaning that's being conveyed there. And, Cause like, for instance, you know, we have Jacob has 12 sons, the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, we know the birth order, but they're not always given in their birth order through the scriptures. You know, sometimes they have them listed out of order. And when you look up the meanings of their names, what their names mean, and put it together in sentences and paragraphs, there's like hidden, hidden codes there. Right. Um, and I first got intrigued by that. By uh, I saw something Chuck Missler did with the uh, first 10 patriarchs before yes. the first Adam to Noah. And just in summary, if you take the meaning of the names of the ten patriarchs from Adam to Noah and just string them together in a sentence in the order that they're given, you end up with, Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that with his death the despairing shall find rest. And, I mean, that's like the, that's like the plan of the whole Bible. Right, right. <laughs> just in the meaning of the ten patriarchs' names. So that's what got me. I'm like, I wonder if that happens you know, more often than just mm -hmm. in that one scenario. And when I was doing my Nephilim research and looking through the table of nations and realizing that every single post-flood Nephilim that we read about in the Old Testament can be traced back to the people given in Genesis 10, 6 through 20 specifically. Um, and when you look at Genesis 10, 6 through 20 at the names in Hebrew and just string their names together in a paragraph, this is what you end up with. He raged, a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker. Black terror, drink thou anguish, compass the chamber. Thunder compasses the smiting. He who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. And then we shall rebel, that's Nimrod. A double straight firebrand, travailing, affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel, forgiven ones bowing to spy. A trafficker, hunting terrors, trodden downsayers, the strangers draw near. Showers of life, gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose, double woolen enclosures of wrath. Wow. And, I mean, that's just, just taking them in the other names and putting them together <laughs> in a sentence. I'm going, there's something up with those kids. Because, I mean, what prompts the proud parents of a newborn baby to look at each other and say, mm, enclosure of wrath, what do you think, honey? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Why would you name your kid Terror or right. Enclosure of Wrath unless there's something clearly wrong with the kid, you know? Uh, and those, incidentally, are the same ones that God repeatedly tells the Israelites to utterly destroy, including women and children. So that's when all of a sudden all those old ideas of this, this strange, crazy God of the Old Testament becomes this amazing God of love yes. and mercy trying to protect his good creation from abominations, basically. Right. So, you know, that was my journey into all that. Now, on, on the flat earth side of things, well, uh, I was going to do my taxes. Uh, it was April 13th, so you know, nothing like waiting till the last minute, right? Well, <laughs> my accountant uh, is an hour and a half drive from where I live. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll, I'll download podcasts or something to listen to when I got to drive like that, you know, and, and here in Texas, everything takes like an hour to get to. So, um, you know, a lot of times I'm downloading podcasts and there's a number of people I like listening to and uh, Canary Cry Radio is one of them, uh, Basil and Gons. And okay. I saw that they had done a show with this guy named Mark Sargent on Flat Earth. And I'm, and I'm thinking, what is this, a you know, April Fool's joke or something? Because they're kind of crazy, goofy guys over there, and uh -huh. you know, they do things for fun. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe this would be a fun show to listen to. So I went into it realizing, okay, this is not a joke. This is serious. But I'm rolling my eyes thinking, this is ridiculous. This is, are you kidding me? This is stupid. Right. But by the time I finished the hour and a half show and got to my destination, my head's spinning. You know, I'm going... <laughs> What did I just hear? And I could barely concentrate when I'm, you know, with the accountant. And I finished doing my taxes with him, and I got another hour and a half drive back home. So I thought I'm going to listen to this again, you know. So I listened to it a second time. 
And then I got home. I said, okay, I got to look up this guy's flat earth clues that he was referring to. So I watched all 11 videos that he had on the flat earth clues. And of course, when you watch stuff like that, YouTube populates other things, you know, related right. type videos. So next thing you know, I'm listening to, you know, Eric Dubay and Matt Boylan and some of these other guys that were the forerunners, I guess, in this movement, if you want to call it that. And I, I was obsessed with it. I'm going, what in the world? Am I, what What is happening here? <laughs> so I thought, okay, I got to talk to one of these guys myself. So I put out some emails to these guys, and uh, Mark Sargent was the first to respond. And so I had him on my show that Wednesday. So literally it was like I heard about it for the first time on the 13th, and then two days later he's on my show. And if you listen to the interview that I did with him, uh, the whole time I'm saying, look, I still believe in the heliocentric uh, expanding Earth model. I, I referred to the works of uh, Neil Adams and his expanding Earth theory that I had just finished teaching about myself back in December of last year. It was something I very much subscribed to, the hollow Earth, expanding Earth theory. And so I'm saying that the whole time I'm interviewing Mark and trying to affirm what I think I believe, mm -hmm. but I'm going, okay, but tell me more. I'm, you know, <laughs> you've got me intrigued, dude. So you know, keep talking. And after that interview, uh, he, because he had challenged me, he basically said, okay, I, I hear you saying, you know, you believe in this spinning globe thing. Um, I dare you to try to prove that without using the words NASA or the government. <laughs> right. Um. Because the first thing you want to do is say, well, we've all, we've all seen the pictures. Yes. You know, in our, in our government-funded textbooks uh, taken by Freemasons and Nazis uh, <laughs> from NASA. Uh, in fact, I grew up with the wallpaper uh, covering one whole wall of my bedroom. My, most of my childhood and early teen years, I had this wallpaper that was taken from allegedly from the surface of the moon looking towards the Earth. Uh, it's like Earthrise kind of thing. They had that famous Apollo 17 um, picture of the Earth on it. So, I mean, that's been in my face most of my life and was one of the things that I put I put that up there because I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, that was my life's ambitions. The reason I joined the Army and went to flight school and flew helicopters, I did all that because my goal was to get into the space program. So I've got all this cognitive dissonance that we all have you know, maybe to some degree more than other people's have ha, have had because that's like, you know, I grew up on Star Wars and Star Trek going where no man has gone before. Love all that stuff, you know, um, and studied intensely with my life ambition to become an astronaut. So this is really challenging me, you know. Um, but yeah. when I started looking into the pictures, you start quickly finding words like composite, <laughs> You know, uh, animation and you know all kinds of stuff that are telling you that you, well, you're not you're not looking at something real. Mm -hmm. It's a computer generated deal. Now the Apollo 17 one uh, is the only one prior to the one that was just released recently, the, the, the most recent blue marble. Were the only two official. I mean, it took them almost 50 years to release another official photograph that is not a composite. And. Yeah. The, you listen to somebody like Matt Boylan, and you look at the Apollo 17 one, and then you do some of your own research, which I did, downloading pictures from the NASA website of Apollo 17 mission uh, with the Earth over the shoulder of the astronauts and whatnot, and bring it into Photoshop, and you start seeing weird anomalies like <laughs> rectangular boxes around <laughs> the Earth and stuff, you know? So now I'm like, I'm questioning everything right, that right. I've been taught and have seen, and then the second thing I did, which probably should have been the first thing I did, but the second thing I did was, okay, I got to go back to the scriptures because I've used Isaiah 40:22 myself. In fact, uh, this week's Torah portion uh, is the third Torah portion in Genesis, and the half Torah portion is uh, Isaiah 40, which includes verse 22, talking about the circle of the earth. And it's funny because if anybody listens to it when I post it this weekend— uh, you'll hear me say, see, Isaiah 40, 22, they, even way back in Isaiah's day, they knew the earth was a globe. <laughs> <laughs> I was preaching it myself, you know, I, the, the circle of the earth means a, a ball. But after I realized, because when I, I was looking at that and I'm going, okay, does it really say that? Because I tried to, when I went back to the scriptures, now I'm questioning, I'm listening to Mark Sargent and all these other guys, I'm, I'm finally questioning the globe and what I've been taught my whole life for the first time. So instead of trying to use the Bible to 
reinforce preconceived ideas, I, I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to the text and try to push all those biases aside, pretend I've never heard of a globe, and just read the text for what it says and see if I would get a spinning ball out of the text. And no way, dude. <laughs> you, it, it, when you take the whole Council of Scripture together, you end up with a circular something that's inscribed into something else that has four corners set on pillars underneath a dome that's not nothing the earth is not moving under a dome within which the sun moon and stars are placed on day four and that one really tweaked me out because I, I, I taught creation science for years uh, at, at, in Sunday school um, at my church and it built upon the works of Carl Baugh and Kent Hoven and, you know, used a lot of their materials and inserted my own thoughts and stuff. But, uh, and of course, if you go that route, you know, those guys teach the canopy theory that there was a canopy of ice surrounding the world. And I taught it myself. So I understand all the arguments. The problem is, if you go back to Genesis 1, it says he put the sun, moon, and stars on day four right. in the firm, the firm not outside yes. of it. And I'm staring at the text. And Zen, I have looked at that text. I can't tell you how many times right. I have looked at it, read it, underlined it, highlighted it, and taught it, and never saw it. Yes. And now, once I pushed all my preconceived biases aside, I'm literally staring at that thing, going, "It says in," and I'm looking it up in other English translations. I'm looking it up in Hebrew. I'm going, "It says in," and and now, and it got even worse when I started looking into um, the stars because if you start questioning. Uh, geocentricity and heliocentricity. This much I will say that I'm pretty convinced of. Uh, I have become quite convinced. I would say mm, I might have 2% that I'm still holding on to, but I'm 98% convinced that this place is not moving and it is the center of the universe. Uh, no matter what the shape of the, the Earth is, it's not moving. And, and that's based on good science. I mean, I didn't realize that there was such a rift in the scientific academic community uh, even in the secular academic scientific community, where there's some really good tests that have never been de refuted or debunked that that shows this place is not moving. And, and just if you take that alone, if this place is not spinning, you've ever been taught. Even if it's a ball, you've got to question everything. And it throws so much of the other stuff out the window. And so when I, I started, well, wait a minute, then what are... If everything's in the dome, and when you start looking up the dome, you realize you know the Hebrews were not not, not the only ones, but I would lean towards the Hebrews uh, cosmology because we believe the Bible is divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men. But but then you find out that everybody in the ancient Near East believed this way, you know. Right. Uh, the Egyptians believed it. The the sky goddess Nut. And people have probably seen the hieroglyph of a woman stretched out in an arch over the people, <laughs> you know, stars in her body, you know, that's the sky goddess nut. And I started thinking, maybe that's why people think you're nuts if you start <laughs> talking. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that was a good one. You know, but I mean, th they all had this snow globe concept. And, and, and I also had to bear in mind that these are people who were building megalithic structures and, and Aztec calendar stones in 3114 BC and, you know, doing stuff that, Today, with all of our modern science and technology, we still can't figure out how they did some of the stuff they did. So, you know, he, these guys were not stupid cavemen. They, exactly. they were brilliant people, yet they all believed the Earth was a, the cosmology of a snow globe. And so, I, you know, I'm looking at that going, wait, well, wait a minute. If, if we're in, a, in, in the dome, the Hebrew described the firmament as firm. It's firmament is hard. Ezekiel uh, tells you why, because it's... God's thrones on top of it. Job refers to it as a molten metallic uh, looking glass or something that's beaten down metal to the point of shining like a, a uh, like a mirror. Um, so I'm going, well, this is, this, there's a firm structure over this place and the sun, moon, and stars, that means they have to be a lot smaller and a lot closer and can't be what we've been told by, you know, Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking and all those other guys. So they, I saw, okay, I'm going to do a keyword search on stars and tell, what are the stars biblically speaking if i come to find out the bible tells you the stars are angels yeah most, most notably in revelation 9 1 i saw a star fallen from heaven and to him was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit so this is a this is a 
a sentient being referred to as a star. And when I looked in the Book of Enoch, it tells you point blank. There's a class of angels called the luminaries that are stars that have a police officer named Raguel who's in charge of making sure they stay in formation, march in the pathway that God told them to march in, or they get you know, put in this terrible place of punishment. So every at that point, I was I, there's no way out for me because I built my entire ministry and my life, in fact, on saying the Bible is my source for truth and I can take it literally. Well, if you've ever said that, welcome to the Flat Earth Snow Globe. <laughs> Because that's what you end up with, and you can't get around it. You can try. You could try to tap dance out of it, but no, chug does not mean ball. And Isaiah is the only guy, at least in the English Bible, in King James, if you look up ball, he's the only guy that mentions anything of a spherical nature in chapter 22, verse 18, but he used a different word, dur. And the word he used for the earth, he didn't use dur, which means ball. He used chug, which means circle. And both Solomon and Job also use the same words to describe the earth, but they add the word inscribed, chakak, before it, that, that the circle is inscribed. Well, you can't inscribe a ball. You can inscribe a circle, but you can't inscribe a ball. So taking the entire Council of Scripture as a whole, uh, at this point, I'm going, well, I have got to keep looking because either that or I've got to throw out any notion of, of the Bible as an absolute source of truth. I've got to throw out any idea that the Bible is inerrant, that it's without error. I might as well throw out the idea that it's inspired by the Holy Spirit because I can't wrap my mind around the idea that the Creator can't accurately describe His description to to the people He's you know inspiring to write, and I certainly can't take I, say I take it literally anymore. So you could see my dilemma. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Because I do believe the Bible is divinely inspired. I do believe the Creator can accurately convey what He wants to convey to His people concerning His creation. And I do still maintain that we need to take it literally, because otherwise you run into the danger of private interpretation, and you can make up anything you want at that point. Yes. It's all allegorical. So, yeah. And now, to address the issue of pillars and hangs the earth on nothing... I have a recent one um, that I just put up on testingglobe.com. And if people want to read the whole thing, they can go to testingglobe.com forward slash pillars.html or in the main menu under One Man's Quest for Truth, you'll see right underneath Angels as Stars the link for Pillars of the Earth. Because um, that's something that I, uh, the pillars thing I kept mentioning, but it was always in passing. Like I said earlier, it's a still flat earth set on pillars, which is about the extent of what I would say about it. Because the Bible does talk about the pillars of the earth. So, um, but I realized something when I looked at Job 26, 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. I thought, well, er earlier, Job, the same guy who wrote this, talked about the circle of the earth and, and it being set on pillars. So is the guy contradicting himself? Or what's going on here? And a lot of people will point to that scripture, as did I myself, said, see, this proves that, jo that Job is saying the earth is hanging or suspended or floating in nothingness. This proves the earth is floating in space. But that's not really what it turns out that he's saying. You know, if, if I said, I, I am in want for nothing, you would understand that I'm saying I don't need anything. You know, if I said, Zen, there's nothing you could do for me, you would instantly understand that there's not anything that you could do for me. Right. So I started to look at that and go, wait a minute, is Job really saying the earth is not hung on anything? The earth is, he hangs the earth on nothing, could be the same way of saying it's not hung on anything. And you, you need two witnesses to establish truth. This yes. is written throughout the scriptures. And you don't have a second witness for the idea that the earth is hanging on nothing. You have plenty of confirming witnesses that it is set upon something. <laughs> Um, there's a number of questions that are coming from the the chat room. There's a you know, of course, I'm sure you've contended and dealt with this yourself. Um, but people have asked me how um, how we could prove that the Earth is flat, and ba you know, basically, I tell them that there's no curvature and the Earth isn't moving, and you know, just with the a stream of smoke when you burn a fire and there's a stream of smoke moving uh... It, on windless days it'll move straight up into the air and unless the wind pushes it one way or the other it will remain a 
straight column, whereas if we were on a, a planet that's moving at 1,037 miles, 38 miles an hour, um, there would be no way that that column of smoke would rise in steady fashion. Um, and also, if, if we were moving at that astronomical rate of speed, uh, how there could be any day where you don't even feel the wind, where the flag outside of my um, in my front yard doesn't waver in any bit, the hair on your head is not tussled in any, uh, you would think that moving at that kind of a speed, there would be just, I mean, you should at least be able to notice some kind of speed. I would also, uh, I mean, um, some kind of velocity to the wind. I would also add that engineers, builders of bridges, canals, um, railroads over thousands of miles, they never, never take into consideration any kind of curvature to the earth, um, being able to see lighthouses, um, the Statue of Liberty, cityscapes, cityscapes over 20, 30, even sometimes 50, 60 miles out with telescopes or high-powered camera equipment. This also verifies that there is no curvature, uh, things like that. But um, I want to give you a chance to, to answer the, that question because uh, I would always say, well, why do people believe that you know, the Earth is a globe and that we're moving at this incredible rate of speed when you don't see that visible in, in the creation? Rob? Yeah, I, I just looked at the uh, chat room and I see somebody there saying, oh, for Fs, you know, right. curse word, sakes, the Earth isn't flat, prove it. I would say, prove it's a globe. And right. do so with NASA, the government, or the military as your source. Because <laughs> those three sources are absolutely proven to be untrustworthy. So, you know, it's fool me once, you know, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Well, continue to believe pathological liars and you're an idiot. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's the reason I created the website in the first place, testingtheglobe.com, for a reason. Because I've never tested it. I've never, you know, I... And I would dare say the person who's spouting off in the chat room has never tested it either. But they're just displaying the usual cognitive dissonance that all of us have. I had the same thing, man. People were on my Facebook page for probably two months trying to get me to look into this before I did. And my response was exactly the same as everybody else. The same knee-jerk reaction. What are you, an idiot? What are you, a moron? This is stupid. This was settled 500 years ago. Come on. I'm not going to look into that. It's freaking stupid. It was settled 500 years ago. You know, we all have the exact same response. But I would dare say now, after six months, um, the 15th of this month, it was, it was six months of doing nothing but looking into this stuff. From the time I wake up to the time I went to the bed, with the exception of, of some health problems that I had to deal with and family drama, that is all I have done since April 15th. I woke up in the morning thinking about it and was looking into stuff all day long until I went to bed. Um, and, and most of the people who are having the knee-jerk reactions haven't done an hour's worth of research. Exactly. And I would challenge you. Those of you out there who are having these knee-jerk reactions, shut up and take one day. <laughs> okay? Yes, I'm going to be forceful. Take one day. Shut up and do your own research. One day. Because if you do, you are going to come away with more questions than answers. You're not going to be nearly as so confident as you are right now in the chat room. <laughs> You're not. Um, and when you look into some of this stuff, like the Joshua Nowicki picture, for instance, taken for almost 60 miles away on the other side of Lake Michigan, there's a whole city. What's the excuse? Well, it's a mirage. Really? Have you ever seen a mirage? <laughs> uh, mirages are typically inverted and wavy and distorted. You don't get perfectly symmetrical, completely, totally clear images like with the Joshua Nowicki picture. Now, some people say, well, that's a Photoshop. It's a fraud. Well, no, you could actually go and see. He's got a whole bunch of photos and, and video. You can actually watch video footage that he did, zooming in on it. But I'll do one better. Ask anybody who lives in that area if they've seen Chicago. Right. Because um, I had some of the same knee-jerk re response. I live in Photoshop. I, you know, a lot of the work that I do is in Photoshop. So I know for a fact that because I do it all the time. I create stuff that I could make you believe almost anything I want you to believe using Photoshop, After Effects, and some off-the-shelf 3D software. 
you know, give me enough time and uh, let me just knuckle down and create something. I can make you believe almost anything. And that's just me with, with about $1,500 worth of computer equipment and a few software packages that cost anywhere from three to $500 a piece. You know, when you think of what the government is capable of doing and what NASA with the billions of dollars that they have to work with, I mean, come on, look at, if, if, you know, when people talk about the International Space Station and things like that, look, watch the television show Extant, watch the movie Gravity, and go to the movie theater right now and watch the, the movie The If you want to see what can be faked in a very believable way, um, watch the documentary uh, behind the scene footage of stuff uh, by Stanley Kubrick when he made uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And see what he did in 1967. You know, look at Star Wars, Star Trek. You know, if this is what Hollywood can do, you, do you know Star Wars was made for $13 million? The original Star Wars movie, $13 million. Um, and when you look at the movies that are coming out now and the blockbuster movies, you're in the ballpark of roughly 100 to $150 million for some of these special effects blockbuster movies. Okay, NASA has billions, trillions if adjusted for inflation of dollars to work with. So, you know, spare me the evidence that's coming from NASA, the government, or the military, because they historically have been proven to be liars. Uh, I mean, how many times do you have to prove that somebody's a liar before you finally realize they're not trustworthy? Then when you go out there and try to do your own terrestrial-based observations, and you, you ask people who live on the other side of Lake Michigan from Chicago, my friend uh, Rick Hummer lives, I think he said, something like 45 minutes away from the, the area where... Joshua Nowicki took the picture, and he said, dude, we've all seen it. He got in trouble as a kid in school telling the teacher, well, you know, if we're on a ball, how come, you know, we can see Chicago? You know? <laughs> um, and in fact, I, I, I'm, I, I would love to go to that area and just do a man on the street with a camera, you know, and a microphone and interview people that have seen Chicago and maybe even go there on a day when it's visible um, and then show them the math. The math on the spherical Earth says you should not be able to see it. The top of the Sears Tower should be 900 feet below the horizon. The, the ground you're standing on and the ground Chicago is, is founded on, it, there's a half-mile difference. Okay? And yet people are seeing it. I went to um, uh, Malibu, and I was having a meeting with one of the guys, my, a, a writer on me with, on the Seed the Series, the, the sci-fi show I'm working on. And he said, you know, Rob, I've been seeing your Flat Earth stuff, and i got to tell you something. He told me the story about how he grew up as a light, being a lifeguard on Ventura Beach. And he said on a clear day, we could all look out and see uh, the Anacapa Arch. Now, the Anacapa Arch is one of these island arches. You know, it's, a, it's got an arch that you could, you know, go under it with like a sailboat or something. The, the top of the arch is 25 feet above the ocean. The top of the island that is the arch is 40 feet above the, the water. And yet at 20 miles out, that should be 200 and something feet below your ability to see it. And, it, the, you know, the, the common saying was, oh, the arch is out today, you know, clear day. So I said, dude, can you take this math? Because this was math that I had been seeing circulating the Internet, showing the, the, the alleged drop-off of the curvature of the ball, what it should be using sphere, spherical geometry. You know, the first mile is eight inches, but it's not, it's not a slant. We're not, you know, the, the Earth is not a slant, so the second is not going to be 16 inches. Because it's spherical geometry, the second mile is 32 inches. The third mile is 72 inches and, and so forth. So I had seen this math going around. I'm not mathematically inclined enough to confirm it. So I said, can you confirm this math for me? And he said, sure. He says, I got a good friend of mine who is a, a professor, a, a math professor at, at the local university. I said, perfect. But pose it to him as a word problem and see what he says. So he went to this guy, his math professor at a university, and said, you know, we're supposedly on our the globe is 25,000 miles in circumference, right? Yeah. Well, what would, what would the math be for if I, if I wanted to know how far below the horizon an object is, it's 40 feet high and 20 miles away, how far below the horizon should the top of that object be? So simple word problem for a guy like that. He does the math, puts it on the board, said, confirmed what it said. You know, at 20 miles out, 
uh, the, the math says that it should be 266 feet. So the, if it's 40 feet high, then subtract 40 feet. So 220-something uh, feet below the horizon. So this guy says to the math professor, okay, so you're telling me that is the spherical geometry for calculation on an object that's 40 feet high to 20 miles away. You're telling me it should be 220 plus feet below my ability to see it, right? Yep, that's correct. He turns to his friend and says, well, the problem is we've all seen it. And the math professor says, what are you talking about? He says, the Anacapa Arch. Now, all of a sudden, this math professor, who just put the math up on the board himself, turns around and looks at the chalkboard and in his brain. I can only imagine the gerbil jumping off the wheel to the sound <laughs> effect of the, of the Flintstones, you know. <laughs> the Flintstone sound effect, right? Uh, as this guy just realized that what he had seen growing up himself is mathematically impossible. Right. And for the skeptic out there who thinks he's all that and, you know, is, thinks that we're idiots for even talking about this, I'm going to call your bluff, okay? I'm going to tell you, to, if you think you know what you think you know, then challenge yourself, and there's three books you need to read. The first one is Zetetic Astronomy by Dr. Samuel Robidum. Excellent book. Second one is 100 Proofs Earth's Not a Globe uh, by William Carpenter. Um, I think it's William Carpenter. And the third one is, uh, yeah, it's uh, William Carpenter. The third one is Terra Firma, Earth, Not a Planet, uh, Proof from uh, Scripture, Fact, and Reason by David Wardlaw Scott. Now, these are all books that the first two were written in the 1800s. The Zetetic Astronomy was written in 1865. It's uh, over 300 pages worth of terrestrial-based observation. Now, because this is 1865, this is pre-Wright Brothers, and certainly pre-NASA. So this is all stuff that you and I can repeat. We can, repeat, we can replicate this stuff. If you, if you say you are convinced the Earth is a globe, then go out and test it for yourself. Don't just re regurgitate what you've been taught your whole life. Go out there and take this guy's book, and now we've got better equipment you know, that we can use than he had, and over 300 pages of terrestrial-based observation. Written in 1865. The second book, 100 Proofs Earth Not a Globe, published in 1885. And, you know, I could go through those hundred, and I did. I've read these three books. Um, because a true researcher needs to be objective and not just try to find stuff that supports what they already believe. You've got to look at all the evidence. So these are good places to start uh, for the counter evidence to, that counters the globe idea. Um, I did go through the 100 proofs, and I would say there's a few that I could argue against, that I could be the yeah, but guy and say, well, well yeah, but this. But I could not refute all 100, and I would dare say nobody listening to this broadcast is going to be able to refute all 100 of them either. Probably the majority of them you're not going to be able to refute. The one book that, that I thought was the most interesting of the three, though, is Terra Firma, The Earth, Not a Planet, Proved from Scripture, Reason, and Fact, by David Wardlaw Scott. This was written in 1901. So here we have, at the turn of the, of the 20th century, a guy writing, and he referred to the works of the other guys that I just mentioned, but had some of his own information to throw in. So I would say, if you are absolutely convinced that you are on a spinning heliocentric globe, then test yourself. Go out and do the test, read these books, be objective, and then go outside and tell me how water curves. <laughs> because that was the question that was posed to me when I thought I was all that. When I was like Captain Arrogant and thought I knew everything and, you know, of course we're on a spinning heliocentric ball, a friend of mine said, yeah, but Rob, how does water curve? I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I mean, look at the Pacific Ocean. How does the Pacific Ocean maintain the spherical geometry of one, of one inch per mile uh, squared or whatever it is uh, for the, the spherical geometry? I mean, how do you bend the Pacific Ocean or any other body of water for that matter to maintain it. Well, our, our knee-jerk response is gravity. Well, gravity. Okay, ask any, any 10 secular spinning heliocentric globe model scientists what gravity is, and you're going to get 10 different answers because they can't even agree on what gravity is. And all that goes out the window of, geocentri out the window of geocentricity is true, especially if stationary geocentricity is true. All of your Newtonian arguments go out the window. Uh, so you don't even know what 
yeah, okay, uh, an apple falls on the dude's head and he writes the theory of gravity in, oh, by the way, 1666, the year 1666. Interesting. And the the globe, if you look at any globe, it's tilted. What's the tilt? Look up the, the tilt of the Earth. You'll see it's 23.4 degrees. Well, 23.4 <laughs> off of a 90 degree straight up and down, you know, center, 90 degree centered subtracts 23.4 uh, 66.6 degrees. Really? <laughs> I mean, why, why, does, why do the beast numbers have to keep popping up right. in, in these arguments? So, I mean, these are the things that got me intrigued in the first place. These are the things that caused me to question the globe enough to want to go and test it. And all the people that are saying, well, for F's sake, you know, you're, you're an idiot, you're a moron, whatever, they haven't tested it. They're just regurgitating what they've been told their whole life. Right. And uh, I, I agree with you. I'm the same way. When I want to learn something, I go out and I read books and I really do the investigation, do the research. And uh, the people here on Revolution Radio, y you heard the first shows that I did when um, a, a friend of ours kept calling in and asking me to research the topic. And back then, I, you know, I, I wanted nothing to do with it. I was just like Rob, just like those of you that are hesitant to look into it now, I thought it absolutely a complete waste of time. And being productive and valuing my time, I did not in any way want to give or dedicate any time to looking into this topic at all. But eventually, my friends convinced me, you know, um, because I, I had um, told people, asked them to be open-minded about other topics of my research and um, I, it was either open my mind and open myself to this possibility do at least one day of investigation into it or prove myself a hypocrite and so I did I put aside everything decided I was gonna give one full day um, dedicate uh, to watching some of the videos looking into some of this information um, I also watched the Flat Earth Clues and several other things that had been sent to me. And I was blown away that I found something that it was relevant. And I began to, after, even after that first day or after a couple of days, I was questioning myself as to why I believed that we were on a globe and why I, you know, why we all have bought into that and have believed that whole premise, the whole, the whole concept of that even the earth is moving. Um, and, and then when I learned, you know, basically having looked into all these things, that you cannot measure any curvature. Curvature does not exist. Um, the engineers, again, for uh, the railroads and uh, canals and these huge, long, very long bridges, there's no curvature. Um, put into the, the the blueprints of building those things and and when I realized that there's no curvature and understood that the earth is not moving I mean again the fact that um, a stream of smoke goes straight up into the air on a windless day lets you know that the earth is not moving um, especially not at the degree that they are saying it, it does that we're moving at a thousand thirty eight miles an hour and that we spin once daily as we annually move around the sun um, and then things like uh, the airplanes uh, you know can you imagine the nightmare of airplanes trying to land on an earth that is moving faster than their the planes that they're flying I mean you know the airline commercial airline flights would not exist pilots would not even survive their training and so these kind of things, you know, when you really start to open yourself to the possibility, uh, look into the to these some of these queries, then you will find yourself in the same position as both Rob and I, and you'll ask yourself why you believe in a globe and why you believe the Earth is moving. Anyways, um, when we get back from break, we will answer some of these other questions. Uh, Rob, people are asking about. You, what you think about the other planets and also you know the what's the edge or what's the outer portion of the earth um, you could probably answer these maybe before we get to break but uh, do you want to pick those two up and then we'll 
pick it up on the other side? Yeah, well, the planets, I mean, look, I come from a Judeo-Christian background, and I'm going to go off of what the Bible says. You know, um, I have looked through telescopes and seen the planets myself, and, and even with the moons, you know, around Jupiter and all that, I've seen it. So they're real. They're there. I know they are. I'm not going to deny that. But how big they are and how far out they are is now a big question in my mind if we are under a dome. You know, um, the 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 ancients were in unanimous agreement about this, the, of the snow globe model. Anybody who denies that hasn't done a, a, a five minutes of historical research. <laughs> uh, it's undeniable. And anybody that I, uh, any scholar who is being 100% honest with himself and with the text will tell you that that's what the Bible says. In fact, Logos Bible Software has a, a, a picture that's now probably become famous on the Internet because of this topic. Um, showing what the Hebraic model was for the cosmos based on what we would say is Holy Spirit-inspired scripture. So the ancients, whether you believe the Holy Spirit-inspired scriptures or not, the, the, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, even the Greeks, uh, the, the Norse, they all describe this, this thing. So if we're under a dome, then the planets have to be a lot smaller and a lot closer. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really questioning all the stuff that we are seeing, the Pluto pictures and the so-called stuff from uh, Mars, uh, especially when you do a Google Earth search and look at, um, uh, I forget the name of the island now, but just to the northwest. Greenland. Yeah, just to the northwest of Greenland. It's an island of Canada. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, that looks exactly like the Mars pictures. <laughs> Um, and, and, and NASA's even acknowledging this is their training camp. Right. <laughs> doing stuff. Well, I mean, great. Okay, I can understand training in an environment that would be similar to where you're going. I get that. But you, I would also say it could be just as plausible that you use that exact same environment to take some compelling pictures and video and pass it off as real. I mean, how would we know? Especially since it looks exactly the same. So, and they got rovers out there, too, and... Mars yeah. exploratory, you know, that's this that whole mission um, and the I guess they have it on their trailers, Mars exploratory research yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, and we're not gonna have time to get to it before the break, but I definitely want to address the the edge. Right. All right, we'll be right. All right, welcome back for final segment, everybody. Um, Rob, before we get to these other questions, I'd like for you to give out your contact if you want to share that your website information and where people can go to find your radio programs and your books sure um, babylonrisingbooks.com would be my primary website you can contact me through that testingtheglobe.com is the site where the, that contains the content we're talking about now and uh, if you go to um, truthfrequencyradio.com and just scroll through the uh, speakers list you can see me there and go to my page there and um, my YouTube channel is just my name Rob Skiba alright um, well the other well there's a lot of dialogue going on in the chat room but the last question I remember that we were going to cover was the outer limits the ends of the earth um, go ahead yeah well um, early on in my investigation into this topic I created a section called Easy Globalist Arguments to Refute. And basically what I had tried to do right from the very beginning was what I call flip the board. Um, if I'm playing, I'm not like a chess master or anything like that, but I enjoy the game. I love playing chess. And if you and I were playing, then I would be in my mind's eye trying to flip the board to, to see what you're seeing from your side. Uh, you know, I'm making my offensive moves to try to get to your king or whatever piece I'm wanting to take, and you're trying to do the same. So when you're making a move, I'm, I'm in my mind's eye. I'm trying to imagine I'm sitting on your side of the board, flipping the board, to see, okay, what does Zen see? You know, why did he just make that move? Was that a stupid move, or did he make that move because I've just made a stupid move myself? Does he see an opening? What's his strategy? What are you thinking? And so I tried to do that with this subject is, is say, OK, I know all the arguments that I would have in favor of the globe. Um, you know, I have the same arguments everybody has. You know, uh, what about this? What about that? What about this? So I decided to say, well, if I flip the board and decided to think like a flat earther, how would I address my own arguments? And so in order to flip the board in that case, I had to do a little bit of research 
in order to think like a flat earther, in order to combat my own questions. And so I put together a list of what I call the globalist arguments, and that's what I call globalist argument number two. Well, if there is flat, how come ships aren't going over the edge? You know, why can't I just take a, a canoe and fly off into space? You know, as one of your uh, people in the chat room was mentioning. Um, well, I mean, that's one of our knee-jerk reactions. But if you actually look into what flat earthers believe, and indeed what the biblical model says, um, this thing's enclosed, so you're not going to fall off any edge. But you would encounter. Uh, on the flat earth map, uh, Antarctica is the outer rim of the circle. And if you just do a Google search on coastline of Antarctica, you're going to find a lot of pictures of two and 300 foot high uh, ice and stone uh, cliff faces. You know, so that sort of addresses the, the issue, you know, the famous picture we've all seen of the ships going off the waterfall, you know, off the edge of the earth. Uh, you're not going to go off any edge because you're going to encounter a two to 300 foot cliff. In fact, um, Captain, I think his name was James Cook, if I remember right, um, was one of the first to go beyond, I think it was um, the 78th parallel or 80th parallel, some, something like that. He got to within telescoping range of th this coastline. The, the 200, 300 foot high coastline. And so he decided, well, I'm going to see if I can circumnavigate this thing and find an opening to maybe go through. And it took him three years and 60,000 nautical miles to circumnavigate Antarctica. This is in his own uh, ship's log. So you're like, well, wait a minute. If the Earth is only 25,000 miles in circumference at the equator, you know, um, then you're at the shallow part of the ball down in Antarctica. And Antarctica's really not a whole lot bigger than Australia, if you look at a globe. So why did it take him three years and 60,000 miles to go around this thing? Uh -huh. You know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And then when you get later into, you know, you know, that's in the 1700s, you get into 1800s and then into early 1900s with uh, Shackleton. Interestingly enough, in 1908, getting on a ship called the Nimrod, going on the Nimrod expedition to try to find Antarctica. What I found interesting about that is Nimrod was born in 1908 AM, according to the biblical text, year since creation. So, you know, here's this guy, Nimrod, who, of course, later builds a, builds a tower to try to reach into heaven, uh, which has taken on a whole new meaning with this enclosed world idea. Um, and then in 1908 AD, on a ship named the Nimrod, going on the Nimrod expedition, these guys are going down to Antarctica. Um, and when you keep looking into the expeditions into Antarctica, of course, you eventually get to Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump in the 1940s. Well, why'd they call it Operation High Jump? Well, because when they finally got there, they had to jump over a two, 300 foot high cliff. You know? <laughs> so I mean, they took the, air, the aircraft carriers with the helicopters and airplanes and stuff to, to get down there to do the high jump. You know, so there's no, you're not going to fall off an edge. And, and even then, when you find that, and if you manage to get up on top of the thing, um, I have been asking people, has anybody, do you know anybody who's gone more than 800 miles in a straight line inland from the coast? And I met a guy just a couple months ago who was stationed in Antarctica for three years as a cook for uh, Raytheon and uh, Lockheed Martin. And so I asked him, I said, did you ever go more than 800 miles in a straight line toward this alleged pole from your coast? Or did you know anybody with any of the people that you worked with that did? And consistently, the answer keeps coming back, no. Um, now, I found people who have gone more than 800 miles, but it wasn't in a straight line. They went in a curved line from one coast to another, but it wasn't straight across. So, I mean, that's my question is, has anybody gone more than 800 miles and to date, I have not yet encountered anybody who has said yes and could document it for me. So this is why I'm questioning this stuff. Right. right. Um, a couple other observations, just with you know the whole solar system and uh, the belief that the Earth is in orbit around the sun. Um, three other things that came to mind when I was studying this information that made me question this whole premise was the way that the phases of the moon have been, um, you know, they've been constant for thousands of years. And if we're 
circling and the moon is circling around us at the same time that we're circling around the sun, the patterns, the phases of the moon could in no way remain constant. Um, the other thing, as far as the the constellations and the, what we see in uh, can observe in the the night sky, as far as the zodiac, the houses of the the zodiac. Um, if we're moving in complete circle around the sun, if we're in six months and we're on the opposite side of the sun, uh, we should see there should be some kind of difference to the stars that we're seeing at night. But this again is the zodiac remains constant even though it also is moving in circle around Polaris as the fixed star um, it's still the zodiac, the houses of the zodiac have remained constant uh, again for thousands of years um, and then the, the other thing with the hours of day and night if in six months we're on the opposite side of the sun the hours of day and night should flip flop and what is 12 hours of day should, on the other side of the earth, be 12 hours of night. But the time, as far as the hours of day and the hours of night, do not deviate more than one hour of daylight savings time twice a year, which, in my opinion, these three things, again, verify that uh, we can in no way be moving around the sun because all of these observations, these direct observations that all of us can make ourselves um, verify that, you know, that the earth is not moving in such manner as is um, postulated with the whole solar system principle. And then the other thing as far as the, the sun being 93 million miles away, it, when you watch it going down during sunset, sometimes there will be clouds in front of the sun and behind the sun. And how is that possible if the sun is 93 million miles away and nowhere near the earth? How could clouds somehow get behind it? Uh, another thing with its setting as it's declining during sundown is when it the rays will stream and fan out from the center of these clouds and they will come um, to the earth in all different angle whereas if it was 93 million miles away all of the rays should be parallel to one another uh, and the other thing with when you watch sunset on a beach across a huge body of water there will be a pillar of light all the way from where the sun is above the ocean in the skies to the feet of the observer and there will be this constant stream. And this stream will remain until the sun goes down, reaches vanishing point, and disappears from view. But the fact that there is this pillar of light all the way streaming between the observer and the sun verifies that the land, or in this case the ocean waves, um, that it's perfectly flat all the way to the point where the sun is positioned above those waves. Otherwise, there would be a break in this stream and there's no way that it could reach you in the manner that it does. And so, in my opinion, these three things which we can directly see verify that the earth is, I mean, the sun is in no way 93 million miles away. Especially, you know, clouds being behind the sun, that would be, there'd be no way possible that that could happen. Rob? Yeah, I, yeah, I've seen some of that footage. I, I, I've reserved. Uh, I, I have not commented on any of that stuff because some of, I could I could go either way on the clouds issue being in front of or behind it. But I will say that uh, now that my mind has been open to questioning these things, this the the usual model that we've all been taught regarding the sun and moon just don't work. Um, I was sitting in my pool. This was probably May or June, so pretty early on in my investigations of all this stuff. And it was one of those days where the sun and moon are up at the same time. You know, and there's plenty of times when the sun and moon are both up in the sky, and you can see them. Mm -hmm. And we're all taught yeah. that the that the moon is receiving its light from the sun. That it, that that the some people think that the the curved phases of the moon are the Earth's shadow. That is not true, even in the spinning heliocentric globe model. 
the phases of the moon are not caused by the Earth's shadow. In, in the standard model, we've all been taught the phases of the moon are based on angles uh, of, the, of the sun and moon and the moon reflecting the, the light of the sun. However, uh, I'm, laying there, I'm sitting in my pool looking up, and I, both the sun and moon are in the sky pretty high up at the same time. And the sun, I'm looking at the angle of where the sun is compared to where the moon is and l- looking at the shadow that is portrayed on the moon. And they're not matching. They're off by anywhere from ten to twenty degrees. You know, if the if the moon's it, the, if the light part of the moon is is the result of the reflected light of the sun, then the shadow needs to be at the same the angle of where the sun is. You know, the terminator. Right. Let's say you got a half moon, then the terminator line should be parallel with the sun, but it's not. It's it's off by ten to twenty degrees sometimes, and it, it gets even worse in the waning phases of the moon. When 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 the you know the moon goes through its waxing phase, its full moon, and then waning phase, the angles are all wrong. And I would just challenge people: start going out there and look. Uh, and look at especially in the days when the sun and moon are up at the same time. And the eclipse, this last blood moon eclipse, really tweaked me out because uh, the office where I'm where I'm at right now has a parking garage, and uh, on, from the roof of the parking garage. I've got a great line of sight of both the east and the west where the sun comes up and the sun goes down and, and everything. And the night we had the blood moon, the moon popped up over the eastern horizon at about 7.11 p.m. And the sun went down at about 7, I think it was 18 p.m. So about seven minutes later, the sun went down. But 45 minutes later, the moon's going into an eclipse. And... We're all taught that the blood moon is a result of the sun and moon being 180 degrees from each other with the earth in the middle and the moon going through the penumbra cone shaped phase uh, of the shadow of the earth. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. How the heck did the sun get 180 degrees different, uh, you know, away from the moon that I'm looking at now coming up almost straight over me in 45 minutes? How did the moon, how did the sun get 180? How did the heck did that happen? How did how did the sun or the Earth get into a position where it's in the middle, such that the sun and moon are opposed to each other, 180 degrees opposite each other in 45 minutes? But that wasn't the biggest problem I had with what I saw. the The moon. I'm looking at the moon. I'm looking towards the east. The moon just come up in the east, and as it started to go into a lunar eclipse, 45 minutes after the sun went down directly behind me in the west, if the sun went behind me in the west and I'm looking at the moon and the earth is the cause of the lunar eclipse then the shadow of the earth should have came from the bottom up but it didn't it came from the left to the right which was from the north I mean none of it made any sense I don't have the answer I posted a video with the question (laughs) I'm going how I you know I look I don't have the answer but I will tell you that I've got more questions because the standard model that we're all taught did not work on the night of the blood moon lunar eclipse. I mean, it just, I can't figure it out. Maybe I'm stupid. Okay, fine. I'm stupid, but I haven't found anybody that's given an intelligent answer that can describe how the heck the earth, you know, and the sun and moon got to within 180 degrees of each other in 45 minutes. And the shadow came 90 degrees opposite of the direction it should have come. I would add that there are historical cases and the, I believe I posted um, links to terra firma and as well as uh, the earth not a globe um, from sacredtext.com in the chat room but uh, if I remember correctly it's in uh, the earth not a globe where there are cases documented of the uh, sun and the moon being above the horizon both of them being above the horizon and visible at the same time that a lunar eclipse happens, which, you know, again, throws the whole um, the scientific assertion that the Earth is, it's the shadow of the Earth on the, the face, the surface of the moon that causes lunar eclipses. I mean, how can that be if the Earth is below both the sun and the moon and they're both above the horizon and visible um, and the lunar eclipse is happening? So... Um, yeah, that's something else recently, to consider. Recently, too, because it's in the book, and I, and I quoted it in one of my videos. I read from the book um, several documented historical cases from the 1800s and, and earlier 
Of course, that's when the guy's writing of documented cases where the sun and moon are both up above the horizon and the moon's going into a blood red lunar eclipse. I mean, that's how, how the heck is that? A, that's, that's impossible according to the standard model. But I thought, because uh, um, when I started posting that, people started, well, how come there's no evidence of it? How come we've never heard of it? And that's never happened since then, and blah, blah, all oh, 1800s. And how do we know that guy's right? And blah, blah, blah. Well, I came to find out that they've that happened recently. Um, like within the last five to 10 years, there have been two or three blood red lunar eclipses documented within the last five to 10 years where the sun and moon were up at the same time. And what's the, what's their excuse? What, what's the, what's their, uh, answer? Oh, refraction. Right. <laughs> of course, it's gotta be a refraction. It's got a mirage or a refraction. You know? Uh, I'm sorry. I don't buy it. There's something, something's not right. Again, I don't have the answer, but the answers that I've been hearing, uh, they don't, they don't jive with observation. Right. Another question from the chat room for you, Rob, uh, from Casey. How high do you think the dome um, is above the Earth? That's a great question. Um, I don't. I'll say up front, I don't know. If what I've been reading is true concerning the sun and moon. They, you know, it varies, but I, the, the furthest out that I've seen the sun and moon is 3,000 miles. Um, and, of course, it's a lot smaller. Yeah, if people using sex stance and stuff like that, I don't understand how this stuff works. I've never used it, so I, I can't confirm it. I just, I'm just regurgitating what I've read and heard from other people say. That using a sex stant, you can calculate the sun is, I think, 36 to 40 miles across at 3,000 miles away. So obviously the dome has to be bigger than that. Um, I've read some interesting stuff from the spinning heliocentric standard view of the cosmos that says there is an invisible barrier that is hard that secular scientists have described as being uh, out there at about, I think it was 7,500 miles. So is that the firmament? I don't know. Um, but if it's not, then they would push the firmament out beyond that. So, you know, I would say... At a minimum, it's probably seventy-five to ten thousand miles out. Um, I don't know, but when you start looking into things like the Van Allen belts and NASA is really shooting themselves in the foot with the Orion project, there's a number of videos that they have been putting out saying, you know, we haven't solved the radiation problem yet for Orion. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, <laughs> you guys supposedly sent dudes in the tin can and jumpsuits through the thing, you know, twelve times, six times there and back to the moon. Uh, why don't you just put them in the same jumpsuits and the same tin can? And oh, by the way, why don't you put on the same jumpsuit and go clean up Fukushima while you're at it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's so good at, you know. So, you know, I, I, there's a reason why the space shuttle program never went more than 400 miles out. And I also wonder when you look at the various launches from Cape Canaveral and, and other places too, um, it doesn't, it never goes straight up. You always see the thing go up and make this big arc. Right. And, and the ones that didn't make the art explode, <laughs> you know, like some of the civilian ones that, that have gone up. You know, are they hitting the dome? I don't know. People need to look into Project Fishbowl, Operation Fishbowl, because, you know, as soon as Admiral Byrd goes down to Antarctica in the 1940s through the late 50s um, and, and they go to Operation uh, Deep Freeze, after Operation Deep Freeze, everybody pulls out of Antarctica, and they draft up the Antarctic Treaty. And this is an international treaty. All these different countries that were previously down there saying, this place is great, this place is amazing, all of the natural resources you can imagine are down here, this place is awesome! Well, they all pull out of there, leave there, sign the Antarctic Treaty, saying nobody can go back, except under the express guidelines of the treaty, uh, you know, under very specific restrictions. And then immediately... NASA's created, 1958. Same time all this is this Antarctic Treaty is taking place, they formed NASA in 1958, and then NASA and uh, or the United States and Russia start launching high-altitude nuclear bombs into the atmosphere, and they called it Operation Freaking Fishbowl. <laughs> so if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy, they aren't helping with the names. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and if you if you do a Google search or YouTube search of Operation Fishbowl and look at the explosions and how, you know how they took what they look like, it looks like they're hitting something. You know, so I don't know, I don't know how, how high it is, but it's really interesting. 
Hey, Rob, we've arrived to the end of the show. I uh, appreciate all of you. We'd love to have you back on, brother, because it seems like we didn't get very far, and there's so much more to talk about.